Thank you. Welcome everyone uh, on our uh, another governance education session. Uh, we are meeting every Monday uh, 2 p.m. EST and it won't change. Um, today uh, we are welcoming Sean. Uh, Sean is a contributor uh, to Gitcoin. He's uh, running the governance or steward uh, group there. Uh, we, I uh, used to work with Sean uh, at Index Group. Uh, at the meta governance or governance group. So we've been exploring some meta governance concepts there. And today uh, he will share all his learning with you all and then we will have a discussion. So welcome, Sean. Uh, the floor is yours. Great, guys. Thanks for that. Um, I think this is going to be an interesting conversation because I've gone around in circles around this meta governance topic for a while now. And quite frankly, I think it's probably one of the least understood aspects in our DAO crypto land. And I think it can also potentially be one of the scariest concepts if it's done incorrectly. Okay, so there's... Um, and that's why I'm interested to have this conversation to, today, because I'm hoping you guys can sort of talk me off the ledge about some of the risks that I see involved in meta-governance and, of course, how powerful it potentially could be. So um, starting with, okay, why should you be listening to me when we talk about meta-governance? Meta so I have done a ton of research and writing on meta-governance and governance in general. So here's just a link of a link of a bunch of different documents that either I wrote or I produced or I commissioned talking about the different components of meta governance. And really it comes down to um, thinking about meta governance across three different vectors, because when people use the term meta governance, we're not always talking about the same thing. And here I'm discussing meta governance in the context of one DAO owning tokens or having tokens of another DAO and participating in their governance process. That's my definition of meta governance today. Now, that said, there is another definition of meta governance that is used in specifically, I think it's the metagov.org organization, which is sort of a research collective. And their concept of meta governance is the governance layer that sits on top of governing bodies. So I think that's their definition. So just be aware, there's two different definitions for meta governance that are kind of in the crypto space today. And I think though, however, this, reference of one token or one protocol using owning or having control of another token, uh, another protocol's tokens, and then participating in their governance process is probably, I mean, that's probably the most widely understood. Let me stop there. Any questions? Is everybody okay on the definition? Okay on the definition on my end. Pankar, did you have any I, questions? I have actually a question. So like if you look at the uh, kind of like the stewardship or delegation, like uh, what you would say like it's different uh, between like delegation and like meta governance. Oh, dude, you're helping me hit this one out of the park. So we're going to get to that because there is a difference between delegation and meta governance. And in my mind, it's pretty small, right? And, and we'll discuss that. And the impact in my mind is pretty big, okay? So let's talk about the three different types of meta governance. The first one is what we call levered meta governance, right? And this is where Punkar, you and I spent the most amount of time at Index understanding this concept of levered meta governance. Levered meta governance is when there is a, a, a you can think of this in the context of a, an index fund or a mutual fund. If you think in the old world, you can have a mutual fund, right? The mutual fund might have many different stocks that are inside of it. And most of the time, each one of those stocks can be used as a vote for um, any core decision that happens at a company. For example, I used to work at Procter & Gamble. I had a pile of Procter & Gamble stock, and every year I could vote on specific proposals from Procter & Gamble. But my votes were basically meant nothing because I had very little. Now, a company that had a lot of Procter & Gamble stock, a company like BlackRock. BlackRock owns a bunch of mutual funds, and they combine all of their Procter & Gamble stock together and they cast one vote or they, they make one consistent vote across their hundreds of thousands of tokens. So they've got a lot of power. Now, in addition to that, BlackRock might have a, a, a specific fund and inside that fund, they've got a bunch of different companies inside of that and they'll make consistent discussions or consistent decisions and stick with a set of principles. 
in the crypto land, the best example is really Index. So Index Co-op, um, their, one of their flagship products is DPI, the DeFi Pulse Index, right? Has got a series of tokens which are inside the DeFi Pulse Index. And many of those are governance tokens, right? And as Index sells the INDEX token, each one of those INDEX tokens contains a series of, or let's say fragments of each one of these specific tokens, which means if I own one index token, um, using that index token, I can go vote on many of these other different protocols. Let me stop there. Questions on that or was that confusing? Make sense? Okay. Now, the difference between levered meta governance and normal governance or meta governance is that in this world, right, I can, if I buy $1 million of index, I can use that $1 million of index and I can vote on probably four or five of those different tokens in there, right? And Punkar, you might know actually better than I which one of those are still relevant, but I can vote on Compound, I can vote on Maker, I can vote on Aave, right? I can use those tokens to vote on those different protocols. Now, the other point is that I'm leveraging, each one of those votes is voting on a poll. And if my vote is in the majority, I am elevating my vote by um, not just using my tokens, but I'm using the entire pool of index tokens, right? Which includes the entire pool of Aave tokens inside of it. So if I go spend, you know, $2 million to buy influence on index, I might be leveraging $80 million worth of, of Aave, right? And so by doing that, I can buy a smaller number of tokens and leverage a larger amount of tokens um, which are owned by other people inside of that index uh, pool. Let me stop there. Make sense? So this is leveraged meta governance. And this is, for example, I mean, I, I kind of hate to use this example still, but Fay, <laughs> Fay is a good example of index. Uh, Fay went out and they bought 4 million um, index tokens and they used those 4 million index tokens to vote on an Aave proposal to help get Fay listed, to get their token listed on Aave. Right. And so it's it's an inexpensive way for them to go and have their token listed on one of these protocols. That's what levered meta governance is. OK. Let me go to the next version of meta governance we're going to talk about, which is the Treasury swap. Treasury swap is pretty simple. For an example, um, back in July, Ave and Balancer did a token swap. Ave said, I'm going to give you uh, uh, 16,970 Ave tokens and you give me 200,000 balancer tokens. So now Ave's got these balancer tokens and balancer's got these Ave tokens. And those are both uh, uh, governance tokens. So now Ave has got that number of votes, 200,000 balancer votes, and uh, balancer's got 16,000 Ave votes, right? So that's the other version of meta governance, a basic token swap, right? So that um, I've got, if I'm on the balancer side, I can now participate in all these tokens, uh, governance proposals, okay? Now, Punkar, to your point, there's a third component, which is the organizational delegation, right? And this is where I think wildfire fits in, and Evan would be interested to hear your proposal on this, but the easiest example is ENS, right? So ENS has a bunch of delegate tokens, and they delegate, for example, to Rabbit Hole, or they delegate to GM DAO, or they delegate to DevDAO, or they also delegate to Colin Pixley. And I think Colin Pixie, uh, Pixley, um, Evan, you can confirm, I think this is basically, um, this is wildfire DAO, right? And so what this is, is this is the delegation of tokens, not the ownership. And that's what's different. The difference is, in this example, um, Rabbit Hole doesn't own those tokens. They don't own 3,256 <laughs> uh, ENS voting tokens. They don't own them. They have been loaned them to use, right, to, to vote on their protocols. So now tell me, here's a question for you. What's the difference if I own a token versus if I am just delegated a token? Is there any difference between the two? And how might I react differently? So, it's the agency question. Exactly. It is the agency question, right? And it's really two different pieces. There's two different components of this from a meta governance perspective. It's agency risk and incentive alignment, 
right? Let's go back to the Ave and Balancer example, right? Ave and Balancer, they have incentive alignment. So Ave, because they own so much of Balancer, they're going to vote for proposals that make the most amount of sense for Balancer, right? It would not make any sense for Ave to vote on a proposal that is detrimental to Balancer, would it? Wouldn't make any sense at all. Similarly, it wouldn't make any sense for Balancer to vote on a proposal that was negative for Ave, right? So that's incentive alignment. So token swaps, you generally have incentive alignment. Now, the other piece of that is the agency risk. Agency risk arises when principal, I'm just reading this to you verbatim, arises when principals, say shareholders or investors, appoint agents or employees and managers to act on their behalf, right? And so it means that um, if you're a delegate, do you really have incentive to do what's right for ENS? as much incentive as you would if you would have owned those ENS tokens? The answer is, oh, Fames, question. You have an answer. Okay. So, well, no, I don't have the answer, but just in regards to um, like using the ENS model. So like mm -hmm. the way that people were delegated or submitted their, their name to be a delegate, um, had really nothing to do with them appealing to the people that they were delegating, but mm -hmm. more presenting themselves as best for the community. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the agency risk definition that you portray is, or showcase, is more aligned with like the proxy voters of like brokerage firms in which they get the proxy votes from their shareholders. And their goal is really to ensure that there's no like devaluation of their decisions in terms of the not token price but the shareholder price right and so what happens like i understand that the role of a delegate is that so so agency risk would make sense but what happens when those delegates purpose is nothing related to the people that are delegating their tokens but on the community approach and i think that that's where we're getting kind of you know, um, like if he, when it comes to delegation and the role of delegates. So I just didn't know if you, using the ENS situation. So that's a perfect example. And what I'll, what I'll draw out as a distinction there is that when you would list out your delegation, so when you go to ENS and when you go in the governance forum and say, here is my principles for how I'm going to vote, right? You are declaring that this is the way that I'm going to behave, right? And you're also promising to behave that way, correct? What's your incentive to behave that way? Your incentive to behave that way comes down to your reputation, right? Because if you say, I promise to vote on uh, cases, I, I promise to withhold uh, diversity inclusion, um, specifically diversity inclusion um, topics, and you vote against a DEI initiative, right? You're going against your principles, right? Now, if you do that, what's your risk? Your risk is that someone's going to pull out and say, hey, you know, I noticed that in your um, proposal or in, in your um, in your forum proposal, you said you were going to vote for DEI cases, and here you didn't. So what are you doing, right? Why, why are you voting differently, right? Now, the question I'd ask is, how often are people held and called to accountable to say, hey, you voted differently than you said you would behave, right? This is where the agency risk comes in, is that your incentives are not economically aligned. Your incentive is to um, protect your reputation. And the argument there comes in, is protecting your reputation more or less important than um, economic considerations? For example, somebody comes to you and say, you know what, um, we're, you are a delegate for, call it a liquidity pool, and I want to get my token li um, listed on that liquidity pool. And I'm going to give you 200,000 of my unlisted tokens that I expect are going to go to $10 each within the next 18 months if you vote for my proposal, right? In that example, where is my incentive alignment? Is my incentive alignment because I've got delegated, I've got delegated tokens? So um, my incentive, I've either I'm either going to protect my reputation, do what I said I was going to do, or I'm going to potentially make a big pile of money and vote for something that may not necessarily be in the best interest of the protocol itself. Let me stop there. Fiends, does that answer your, does that 
answer your question, draw a, a distinction between um, the uh, the agency risk that is involved in, like, even an ENS case? Yeah, I mean, but I think also in the ENS case too, we recognize that sometimes a misvalue alignment doesn't really impact people's reputation. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, exactly. I think it's just checks and balances, right? So, yeah. So that's the other issue. And, and okay, so let me stop there. I'll, I'll go on in this. Punkar, uh, to your question. No, I just wanted to add to it, like, I, and basically that's what Fim said, like, I don't think it's enough, kind of, like, we are not really, like, we are always saying, like, you need to keep your reputation, it's everything gets on-chain, so visible, but people forget probably within, like, five, ten minutes of uh, your wrong decision, so, like, it, it doesn't really, like, you know, usually it's, like, if it's not really something, like, groundbreaking it's just like you vote something what maybe you should have voted other way like people would kind of forget or vote not notice and uh I we had the discussion previous as well like these incentives need to be strengthened and like i think like and i don't want to spend more time on it like i think there are two ways how to strengthen it and it can be combined as well one is like professional delegate organization uh means there you are risking much more than as an individual. Individual theoretically can, you know, half of the people are anons, so they can just change the nickname and let's start fresh. But if you are building like, you know, organization which should have some value, there might be bigger risk because multiple people are involved. So they will like, you know, be more careful to do that. And the other one is economic incentive. What you said, like, if I get from balancer, or someone like ten thousand dollars vote this way, but it will harm the original protocol. I should be incentivized not to taking those ten thousand dollars, and rather be like protecting the the protocol I am, like you know, delegate on, and that kind of economic protection should be provided by that protocol to me, which is like kind of the maker case, like there where you are getting paid for being a delegate based on how how much power you have so it's kind of a protection against bad behavior i would say or uh bribing uh in the sense cool i think that's it i'm going to circle back to that one but i want to go back to crypto dad and then evan's got a comment uh let's say a comment there as well so let's go to crypto dad you're next Thank you, John. So I'm wondering actually um, if any protocol they would have a watchdog or sort of a mechanism to um, monitoring the to sub, you know, agency, um, either KPIs or OKRs. You know, like traditional corporate setting could give a report to their you know the original token holders. But, you know, do we have those type of experiments? Yes. <laughs> So that's a good question. So the question there is, is there a watchdog organization that is monitoring to, monitoring to make sure that delegates are doing what they say they're going to do, right? Mm -hmm. I have never heard of one. And I think to Punkar's point is that our life, let's say a news story life cycle in crypto is about five minutes, right? It's like, I just went and checked and Bill Kwan still has a million Twitter followers. <laughs> He's still got tremendous influence after this entire debacle. And I think I saw that he's now, there's an international, let's say, um, international arrest warrant out for him today. But he still has a million followers, right? So, I don't know, do you guys, have you guys heard of anything that's, let's say, acting as that watchdog group for nefarious voting? So maybe I just can quickly comment on that. Like, I think this should be, and it is, like what the kind of who delegating are watching. Like uh, when I like make an example, when we are talking to large uh, holders, you know, VCs, Wales, and so on, like they are reading our decisions, like every single one, because they have big stake in it. But in ENS case, uh, it's very different because like those are small, I have delegated my ENS Two years ago or what was it? And like I have no idea to whom actually. And like 
I don't have any incentive to check it out, but in case, you know, of like, if you are VC, you have 10%, 5% of the protocol. Like, I think you are the watchdog actually. So, okay. Uh, Evan, over to you. I've got a quite, I've got a kind of sort of a comment on that one too, but Evan, uh, let's go over to you. Uh, no, just a quick comment, uh, showing a little bit, the the steward report cards, which don't address the full agency problem, but they at least show whether assuming they're accurate, of course, but, um, but they're open source and uh, you must have all seen, or you may have all seen them from uh, Gitcoin. So they, they at least show, Hey, are you voting, <laughs> you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It can be of some use, I, I think. Um, so anyway, that that's, that's one, uh, the other, are just for me when i'm thinking agency problem what I, I actually would have thought the more fundamental one is operators who really uh, have potentially very different incentives than holders of the tokens and um and so in a sense meta governance exists to address that agency problem so we're already at one level of meta i think and then we went to the second level of matter, like who watches the watchers, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, but um, just want to make that comment because I mean, I I see, and am you know close to a couple of DAOs where it's like explicitly like, yeah, we don't know if the token's ever going to be of any value. But anyway, we're not even going to talk about that, and uh, let's move on. <laughs> like, if you're a holder, presumably that's not fully aligned. But if you're an operator, you know, there's lots of good reasons why you wouldn't want to care about, certainly in the short term, token go up and, and, and you know, those sorts of questions. So, Evan, let me ask a question for you on that. One. So how does that pertain from a meta governance perspective? If you've got an operator and if you've got a, a token operator, let's say a protocol operator and a token holder of that protocol and their incentives are not aligned. Right, so if I own a governance token, I'm expecting the index governance token to go up and it keeps going down. The operator says, I really don't care about it. It's about the work, right? So how does meta governance help in that case? Well, if the governance is primarily others that are inside the DAO, um, then of course they have conflicts uh, themselves, right? So they they may vote their own book, uh, which is, you know, let's keep spending all the money for example, because we're spending the money on me. So there's that, um, whereas uh, someone at meta governance um, you know, wouldn't have those same incentives, but that's one. Second is you touched on, a couple of people have touched on reputation. So if you can you know, be like, for example, Peter Pan, and this, uh, just because I'm a fan of this most recent uh, forum post on, on SAFE that we chatted about a little bit on, uh, Telegram, you know, yeah. and actually say, hey, here's a structure, you know, if you can add value across multiple DAOs, then presumably you become, uh, you increase your reputation. So maybe those incentives work for you to be the one who says, hey, you know, the emperor is, uh, you know, has no clothes or is spending all the money on whatever. Sorry, you get the idea. <laughs> Yeah, so I think the other point there, Evan, that you pull up, which is why I was interested in this conversation, is to think about different ways that meta governance could have an impact. And I think what you're drawing out there is an operator um, who is working for a protocol, and they say, you know what, let's give everybody a 20% pay raise. And then you've got token holders that are like, oh, hold on, that's not a good idea because you're going to drive my token price way down if you do that. right? And what you're suggesting there, Evan, is that meta governance can help us in that example if the tokens are allocated to an external group of people, or let's say if they're allocated to an external holder that is not the, let's say a core or core contributor group, right? And I think that makes sense. And the difference here again is it's ownership. It's like, who's got the ownership of those tokens? Whereas if it's a delegated case, uh, I mean, they're supposed to work on behalf of the protocol, but maybe they will, maybe they won't, right? Right. Excellent. Now, um, the thing that I like about the Dow Stewards proto, um, the Dow Stewards report card here is you're right. You can see how you can see activity. You can see the activity they're doing, but you can't see how they are. Um, you, oh, okay, let me say it differently. You can go in and you can see their statement, right? So if you click a button, you can go back and read specifically their statement, and then you can also look and say how did they vote, right? But I think the other point is that 
there's nobody watching this, right? Nobody's keeping an eye on this. And it's real easy to, um, it's real easy to, to go say, I'm going to go do something. I'm going to vote. Uh, I'm going to vote these principles and then behave a completely different way. The piece that I'm going to draw a distinction to here is in real life versus crypto. So in the real world, I built this matrix, I don't know, a couple months ago, trying to draw a distinction between two different paradigms. You've got centralized versus decentralized, and you've got opaque versus transparent, right? And I would say that if we're looking at this, this kind of like this, this um, matrix, is that over here on the far left-hand side, you've got the traditional finance investor stewardship. So investor stewardship is extremely transparent, right? I can go to BlackRock's website right now, and they've made over 10,000 votes last year, and I can see exactly how they voted on every single one of those votes. In addition to that, they pull out, put out a report every quarter saying, here's our core principles, and this is what we're going to support. And if they have a vote that is counter to, if they're voting against a proposal, they specifically call out the reason why they're voting counter to that, right? So it's, 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 it's really very transparent. It's totally centralized though, it's totally centralized. So um, if I invest in uh, BlackRock, there's no way I can use any one of those stocks that are inside of that currency, inside of that um, fund. I can't, I can't use it as a vote. It's, I'm, I'm expecting BlackRock to do that on my behalf. Now on the other side of that is crypto token holder voting, right? So if I own uh, Aave, I can go vote on Aave, right? And I can see exactly how I vote and I know how I vote and I can see it on chain. So it's totally decentralized and it's totally transparent. The other piece of that is, crypto centralized meta governance. And what I mean here is that how is Balancer using those Aave votes, right? I don't know. How is How are um, any of the large ENS holders voting, right? I can see how they're voting. Um, does it match to their principles? Do they tell us when those principles don't match? Um, and to crypto's dad's question is, is there any watchdogs that are out there looking for this to try and determine is there something nefarious going on? The answer to that is basically no, right? I don't think anybody is doing that. Um, so I think kind of where we are today is we're not very transparent. We don't have very good format. We don't have very good controls in place. There is no watchdog organization. And additionally, I would say we don't really even have an expectation that a delegate clearly articulate how they vote and why they voted the way they did, right? So. I think we're in a pretty, um, we're kind of in a dangerous place in terms of meta governance. And what's gonna change this? The point that's gonna change this is when somebody goes off and does something nefarious with a governance vote and decides to amass enough tokens or borrow enough tokens or leverage enough tokens to liquidate somebody's treasury, right? And make a governance decision and kill a protocol. I think that's where we're going to see, that's the next step that's going to cause us to do something to try and resolve the situation that we have met with meta governance today. So I, I don't think we're in a good way. And I think the only thing that's gonna make that change is really going to be um, a negative event that's gonna kind of shift this world, uh, shift our, our crypto world, right? So let me stop there. Questions, comments? you had your hand up yeah, yeah uh but dinama uh go first i know you had your uh, oh, hand raised yeah i i just had a sort of a comment as opposed to a question which is uh, why is i understand liquidating the treasury may be a bad event but it's not necessarily a bad event right i mean that could be an, an act of um in the in the interest of the of the token holders but they couldn't have done it um, in concert. So that that's one. The other comment that I had earlier on is the example, and, and I apologize for being a little bit late, but the example that you had used was something about DEI initiatives. And the problem with those is generally they're either um, very difficult to measure unless you say something very specific about how you're going to measure those in advance of you, you know, dictating your standards right so a lot of times as a steward there may be fairly easy ways to measure certain certain parts of your standard 
but others have either long lead times. And the example I typically use is education and social media. So those are long lead times in the sense that you put it in the investment early, but you're, it's difficult to measure and the ability to even get the result might be too far down the road for you to, to be able to witness it. So those are issues, not necessarily with principal agent problems, but with how do we, how do we measure when someone is doing the job that they say? Now, I do like your statement, um, which is giving justification for your decision, especially when it goes against what could be perceived as the stand that you've di dictated for yourself, makes a lot of sense and puts it in the record. It's almost as you, the judge in giving a dissenting court opinion explains why exactly they dissent, right? And that's useful for both precedent and also to, to judge whether they're being consistent over time. Um, so I, I had to throw a bunch of stuff in there, but but my other piece is it's not always, you know, not always bad. And DX Dow is one that I'm struggling with personally nowadays um, because they had a windfall gain, right? Their original reason for existence was give us a budget, we'll create a certain set of products and we will build those for you. Then their treasury went up like over 10 X and people are saying, well, what are you going to do with the excess funds? And there's a there's a reputation token that's used for voting, and then there's a DX DAO token which is used as almost like a residual claimancy token, except for the fact that those people that own it can't do anything to place their claims on the treasury. Um, so a lot of I, I'll I'll shut up now because there's <laughs> a lot of stuff in there, and I'll let you kind of respond or others ask similar questions. So I captured three different things there that I'd like to respond to, but let me stop there and say, is there any other comments or any questions that um, and Dynamite had brought up? No, okay, let me take a stab at it first. So let's talk about um, the example I brought up of saying, you know, there's an activity to where somebody amasses enough tokens or borrows enough tokens or leverages enough tokens to initiate a, um, a treasury, treasury liquidation. Yes, that might be the best thing for the DAO at that particular example. But really what I'm trying to draw out there is an example to where it's a nefarious intent for the majority of the to token holders, right? And so what I'm trying to draw out is that I think there is an event that's coming that is a nefarious event to where somebody's going to come in and sneak in with a vote um, that is going to do something that is nefarious for a token or for a um, for a protocol that had the other voters been awake, they would not have supported, right? And what I mean by that is what, how many would 15%, like a 15% response rate on a vote on a vote is freaking awesome, right? So if we have 15% response on a governance vote, that's great. But okay, you don't need even 15%, you need 7%. So if you got seven and a half percent, you can overcome the majority of those people who vote. And that's what I'm suggesting could happen. Um, so to your point is like, it's not whether liquidation is good or bad. It's just it's a nefarious event that sure. is a bad result for the overall token holders. So that, that, that makes sense. So I agree with you. You're right. Um, the second piece is principles are difficult to define, and they're also difficult to follow. And what I mean they're difficult to find, I, I don't mean that, that they're, they're hard to define. I, I know, I'm saying, let me say it differently. It's hard for a person to sit down and say, these are my principles. It is a long exercise. It's difficult for an organization to say, these are my principles, right? So you've got two different, the, the starting point is it's difficult to define those. And the second piece is, it's difficult to live by those. And the third piece is, if you behave counter to those, it's difficult for anybody to hold you accountable for it, right? And I think the issue that I have here is that, um, we don't have enough people that declare what their principles are. Sure, they they list out their their CV on ENS, right? Um, are they really declaring what their principles are? Maybe they are, maybe they're not. And is anybody going to hold them accountable if they behave differently? And you're right, D and DEI is probably a bad example, right? But I remember the case to where, um, if you remember, I don't know, six months ago, Rabbit Hole had an entire pod that was focused on meta governance. And Rabbit Hole defined specifically what their um, principles were. And every time the meta governance team on Rabbit Hole voted, they would specify how they were voting according to those principles, which I thought was a watershed moment. And I don't remember who it was, but I think it was actually ENS, um, that there was a director that came up for revote. And 
at some point in time, when that director, when they were going through like old tweets, they found some either as homophobic or sexist comments in the past. And Rabbit Hole said, we're going to vote against this person because it does not withhold our principles. That was a great example to where they said, I have principles. Here's a case to where electing this person is counter to those principles. And this is the way we're going to vote. That to me was like, that's what we need, right? Another example of what I think we need is I can look at Flipside Crypto. So today, Flipside Crypto, and I just noticed this a couple weeks ago, is that, or maybe it's a week ago, they have started articulating their governance votes, specifically what the vote is. Here at the very top, you can see MakerDAO, the MIP77, delegates in the Maker Protocol, right? Um, what the issue was, how they voted, and why they voted that way. That's the kind of transparency that we would then be able to say, hey, you know, flip side, you're not voting according to your principles, right? And we can point and say, you're not voting according to your principles. And, and even this example that you have here doesn't make sense, right? But in the absence of this, it's going to be darn near impossible to do this. So I think Flipside Crypto is setting out one of the best examples I've seen to date of the right way to do this since I think Rabbit Hole was probably the best example early on. But I think th this is the next best example to where we have where somebody says, I'm voting. This is the way I voted, and this is how I'm. This is how, this is why I'm voting that way. Uh, let me stop there. So I just said a bunch. Yeah, no, that and this is exactly the same. So e even when you dissent, giving your dissenting opinion, and it's almost, I'll, while principles are nice, if you if you lay out the reasoning of your decision for every single decision, the principles will either be implicit or it will be well known that you're not governed by any principles at all. Right, you're just being. Uh, very pragmatic, but either way, I think stating the uh, the objectives that you were trying to pursue and why you voted this way or that make a make a tremendous amount of sense and create a, a record, right? You're being a judge. You're judging. You're creating a decision, and you're giving an opinion on that decision. That seems to work in other places. Um, so why shouldn't it work here? Yeah, exactly. And I think your point is like. Um... By declaring your principle is just a starting point. It's like a baseline. It's like saying, sure. you don't have to guess my principles. I'll tell you what they are, and then you hold me accountable. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so I, I would, I mean, I hats off to Flipside Crypto for taking this approach. And I think they, I don't know if they do this once. Yeah, I think they, they sent out this report once a month declaring exactly how they're voting. Um, and I think we definitely need more of this. Okay. Um, now, let's get back over to the delegated voting. Now, Punkar, if you remember, the first question you brought up was, what's the difference between delegation and delegated meta governance? I think they both have the same problem. They both have this agency problem that's related. And then to your point that you brought up earlier, Punkar, was we, if we delegate to individuals, it's more difficult to, to show that are they behaving to their principles versus if I delegate to a professional organization, right? And Punker, I agree with you in the case that the professional organization behaves the way that Flipside Crypto is by stating, this is what I voted, this is how I voted, and this is why I voted that way. If they're delivering that along with their principles and they're living according to those principles, um, you're right. It might be easier that we delegate or that we, um, it might be more, it might be safer to send those delegated uh, tokens to a professional organization that we can hold accountable. I just the the only issue that I have with that is the centralization, right? It's like you have, I mean, anytime you get a a a, a big wad of tokens and influence to an organization, they've got a lot of influence, right? And that that's the only thing that makes me feel a little bit dirty. Yeah. So if if I may maybe comment on that, like I think there needs to be the right balance because we. We are trying to do the de delegation because we don't want everyone, like, not the, we don't want it, but like, it just, there is no way that everyone can be involved in the same capacity and spend all the time to basically researching on the world and what is the world going to do and how it influences protocol and so on. That's why we do delegation at the first place. But like, without some level of concentration within the delegates, what's the motivation for delegates to actually do the research? So like Sean, what you said, like you are worried about centralization, but where is the centralization actually a good thing? And when it becomes a bad thing, it means like when the level of 
influence actually incentivize those people to do, uh, do better job and when the level of influence turns into malicious activity uh that you can over overturn any vote kind of thing and you can like vote for yourself uh in that sense but not for the for the protocol uh, or for a good in the good uh you know uh in the good faith uh so yeah so i think we need to be mindful of like defining those lines because like yeah there is more centralization than it was but it might not be that centralization which is actually already bad that's a good point and okay so themes over to you for your your comment oh so just like adding to that i think that once we arrive at the delegation point like it's no longer decentralized right like as a token holder if i'm delegating my tokens to an individual my assumption is that those individuals will then act on the best of my behalf right like on my interests my values and things like that so like what i'm actually curious about is that why is it that we really haven't i don't know allowed for those relationships between delegates and delegatees to actually happen so that the delegate the people who have tokens have been delegated to can act in their best interest, but then there's checks and balances. So like for an example, like, you know, in, in real life, like brokerage firms, they do proxy voting for some of the shareholders, right, of a particular company. Um, and then they submit, you know, how they voted their reports or whatever. And then that shareholder can then determine whether or not those people have been acting on their behalf. Like, I think that it's a little naive of us to assume now because we're passing the buck <laughs> on decision making to somebody else, that dele delegation would still fall under decentralization, which isn't the case, right? We're we're giving not the power but also the responsibility to an individual. So, like, what I'm just kind of curious about is that are there any in existence that you know of in which they've created a small Telegram group <laughs> where everybody <laughs> and the delegatee um, or the person that they're delegating to can then discuss like how they should vote. Like, I think that if we were allowed that, like that would A, make it much more efficient, B, allowed some sort of accountability with the people that, the, for the delegates, and like C, would ensure like the reality is, is that I am delegating this to this individual because I want them to fulfill, they align with my incentives and my decisions and things like that. So I feel like it would just be much more transparent if those types of behaviors were allowed to happen and to happen in the open. Well, not in the open, not everybody's sharing what they want to vote on, but you know what I mean? Understanding that when they're voting, they're voting on the behalf of these token holders, you know, rather than assume that they're actually going to be voting on the on the, be the benefit of the DAO, which isn't the case, right? Yeah, so you, you said quite a bit there, and I think really, um, I can think of two examples to where you've got organizations that are acting on behalf of voters um, and having a discussion group, uh, or let's say having an internal discussion on the proposals that are made. And actually, Punkar, you might have better visibility to this in the work that you did on the Meta Governance Committee for um, at Index Co-op. So Index Co-op, um, if there is a Meta Governance vote, and that meta governance vote does not get to quorum, not enough people participate, then it goes into an internal group and the internal group is what I think five members. And then there would be a discussion or a vote internally and they would decide for the organization how the vote's gonna go. Now, Punker, I think you actually ran that group in the past. And I think there, in some cases there was discussion, but I think in some cases there was not discussion on those particular votes, right? Uh, so, there was always transparency, I would say. So there was uh, a, you know, group chat where like those were posted the p potential like how uh, we should vote, and then if it was, there was no objection, uh, the vote were executed. There was twenty four hour gap uh, between like end of the uh, vote at index and end of vote at the protocol, and it usually been like if someone is involved, let's say with compound, uh, they would not have the bet best information about what is actually going to happen when this will pass or not and they could have provide guidance to the other uh on the committee and if there was no like something odd let's say or someone didn't have like like really different opinion on it it was executed so it 
99% very, very smooth, uh, just because like they trust each other. And I think the trust is also very important here. So even you don't need to vote on everything. If you know that that person would do the best kind of decision on compound votes and the other person maybe on other votes and you're just checking each other uh, and you don't, you basically like that's the kind of the positive, like kind of optimistic governance. If nobody says no, it's just yes. Mm -hmm. So there's one example. Second example I could think of is probably like the uh, Gitcoin Steward Council or the Gitcoin Steward Circle, right? And that's a group of people who are, they have multiple people delegate to them. Um, they have a certain amount of influence. And here, I think themes to your point, if you're delegating to an individual, is that still centraliz is that centralization or is that decentralization? Here is an example to where what I, what I do like about this format is it tells you what their voting weight is. I mean, if somebody's got 2% of a vote, that's a pretty big amount, right? But it's not 50%, it's not 30%. So at least there's the visibility to see how much vote do these people have, right? Um, so from 2% all the way down to 0%. So I think that's helpful to where we can see, is there is this dealt, is this centralized yet or not? And I don't know what the, at what point, you know, at what percentage do we say it's centralized versus not? It's probably a function of how many people are voting. So if, you know, 10% of the population is voting and this guy's got 2%, eh, it's probably close to centralization. However, if 50% of the people are voting, right, and we're only, he's only controlling 2%, it's probably less of a concern, right? Um, Dynamite, you've got a point is that we're talking about a judgment call being paid. What is good for the protocol versus the users, especially if the governance mechanism is token weighted voting? My point here is that token weighted voting or allowing concentrations to influence decision making is a value judgment that occurs when deciding the institutional rules. Can we really say there is a nefarious event if someone is playing within the rules of the institution helps make a decision, even if it is not in the stated interest of the individuals? So um, I think. I think the point there is that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's basically saying, if I've got enough influence and I make a vote, um, could it be said that my vote is against the will of the organization if I'm making that vote and I have the um, I have the majority of the tokens that are cast? Yeah. Is that right? And, and the larger question is, is when you're setting up those rules, there is a value judgment that's being made. And I'm I'm ignoring technical issues like civil attacks and things like that. Mm -hmm. But are we do we decide that token weighting voting is the is the way that we need that we want to institute decision making? Because that itself is saying that we don't mind the risk associated with individuals concentrating voting power in however we whether it be by delegation or by token weighting in in some non-delegated sense so my only point is is not necessarily that specific example but the idea of creating these institutional rules and making judgments on what we think is the good right what what is the objective we're trying to pursue because a lot of this discussion is the objective isn't governance as much as it is we we like to centralize governance right Governance is just decision making, and there's good and bad points about centralized versus decentralized decision making. So, what's the objective function of the institution itself? What does it want to pursue, and how does the voting model help promote that higher objective? So, oh, go go ahead, Pukar. Go ahead and respond to that one. I just, just like I think this is a really good point. We have basically talking just about token weighted governance here. So, and there are many other concepts, which I don't think we have touched upon. So, so great I mean, comment, Dynamite. I, I, and I would echo that. I mean, it's really, we're talking about token weighted voting, right? And we're also talking about delegation. Now, I would argue that these are both kind of old ideas, right? We're taking old ideas and plugging them into our new paradigm. Sure. I don't think that token weighted voting is our endpoint, and I don't think delegation is our endpoint. I think there are other solutions that we have not invented yet that are probably better for the token holders and the protocol. There's better ways of making decisions. We haven't gotten there yet. What we're doing is we're replaying old tapes. We're finding things that we know about and we're using them because we know how to use them and they've worked in the past. I'd argue that I think there's plenty of room for innovation and we still have to figure out the best solution 
forward. And I don't, I don't, I don't think delegation. I'm not a fan of delegation. It's, I'm becoming less and less um, enamored to it. And I think token weighted voting. I, I, I mean, the world has run on token weighted voting via standard capitalistic models forever. And I don't know that that's the best thing either. So I think there's, I think there's better solutions. I think our hard job is to go figure out what those are, what those solutions are, and to deliver them. That's the end of my rant. Agreed. <laughs> wow. Hot stakes at the end. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, Fiends, that all I have, that's all I have for you. Oh, that's totally fine. I mean, we're four minutes in. I mean, almost done. Um, if anybody has any last thoughts or questions, now's the time. Maybe this is something to take up, uh, you know, in a side channel in the future. But um, I think part of it is sort of the provenance of the who are these token holders? If that makes any sense. I mean, in the venture world, you sort of select them, um, and you have years, you know, growing the organization, uh, and then they select you, like they can fire you, <laughs> but they're your board members, right? Um, and uh, and it's a bit different, right, in, in this world, I think, where we effectively go pseudo public really early. And uh, you may be a whale if you found at the Dow, but you may also get, you know, uh, whales coming in and uh, changing things. So there's something about the trust or social wear that is a bit different. Um, and maybe that's that's a whole kettle of fish that we could uh delve into in the future but i think the provenance the history of where did these people come from did you know them i think and at least in a couple dows i'm involved in ends up being impactful i mean if there's any concepts theories or models that anybody's interested in like you know the floor is yours to present just hit me up and and let me know um next week um Daniel Ospina from Arendal will giving a presentation on their organizational design, particularly when it comes to fund allocation. So anybody in treasury might be interested in this. Um, so from community vote to team to team. So feel free to drop in next week, same time on Monday. Again, that's with Daniel Ospina from Arendal. And then of course, conversations can continue on our Telegram channel. Thank you, Sean. Excellent. Sure Thanks, guys. It was fun. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Let's keep having fun. <laughs> thank you, guys. Have a good day. <laughs>